Welcome to the Nebraska Soybean Board Weekly Market Roundup, being brought to you by Nebraska Soybean Farmers and their checkoff. I'm Susan Littlefield. Uh, WASDE report came out on a Thursday. How did the markets react? And you might want to think, how do they even come up with these numbers? We're going to find out about that and a whole lot more on this week's report. Imagine a future fueled by soy-based possibilities. A future where creativity and productivity live together under one roof. A future that takes you from point A to point B to point Z, all while ensuring brighter tomorrows for our next generation. A soy-based future? It's already here. Well, welcome back. As you can see, joining us today is Jeff Peterson. Jeff is with Heartland Farm Partners. And Jeff, a WASD report of Thursday coming out on that midday um, some knee-jerk reactions to start out with, and then it just kind of seemed to hang out there, and those those reactions didn't change much. Uh, what are your thoughts on those numbers? Yeah, you're exactly right. You know, the re- report came out, and and we we went ahead and put some pressure on both the corn and the soybean market. And when it pulled back down, you know, I thought, well, maybe we'll find some recovery. But then we come into today, and we we kind of have the continuation, and the market went ahead and pulled back a little, little bit lower but what was really good to see Susan is that even a positive higher number for the day and we we're about 10 cents off of uh, the lows on the soybean side but let's dig in and talk about the numbers just a little bit and a couple things that that really caught our attention and and I know maybe we shouldn't have been surprised because the trade was looking for a little bit higher yields but we as a company and I as myself was also a little surprised on the yield side but let's look at those um corn yield came in at 174.9 that was up about 1.7 bushels higher than what kind of the trade was expecting um what about 1.9 bushels higher than the October report and the hard thing for us to think about is that based on the weather we had that was still 1.5 bushels higher than what we ended up having for a yield last year. Now, the beans weren't quite the surprise that we ended up having over on the corn side, 49.9 on the yield. It was up about four tenths from what the trade was ex- expecting, about three tenths higher than where we would have been in the October report, and then about three tenths higher than where we, where we would have been last year. But I do want to highlight a few items in addition to the yield there, Susan. When we, we take a look at how does that yield number, how does that come into the WASD report? How does that come in and actually look at the balance sheet numbers? You know, what that did is that did increase our production on the corn side about 170 million bushels. Now, anytime we see an increase in production, normally what will happen with USDA is that uh, they'll physically, um, as a result, the thought is that prices probably go a little lower. That should help us on the demand side. And- and that's exactly what we ended up seeing. We did see them raise the feed demand 50 million bushels. We saw them bring up the ethanol demand 25 million bushels. And then they also did bring up exports 50 million. So as a result, we brought the, the demand up 125 million. So in the end, we only increased the ending stocks 45 million bushels. And I think that's probably why you know, we didn't see a, a bigger move lower on the corn market, Susan. Well, you know, some might wonder too, Jeff, how those numbers are all determined and and where do we get those yield numbers from? Yeah, you know, the further we get in the season, the generally the belief is is that the more accurate the numbers should be. And I and I believe that. And as we dig in and look at those numbers, you know, there's objective yield studies that are done. So basically there's plots out there that NAS goes ahead and sets up here in November and and they would have had plots across, you know, 10 different states uh, on the corn side, 11 different states on the soybean side. But in addition to that, they do also supplement that because since we have more states that produce corn, they do reach out there and they actually survey farmers. And for this particular sampling, there would have been 5,830 samples that, or surveys that would have been sent out. And those would have been got sent out from October 30th through November 6th. Now, in addition to that, they also do use some satellite data across, you know, the major corn producing areas, you know, Western Corn Belt, Eastern Corn Belt. They bring all that data together to be able to give us our yields on both the corn and the soybean side. 
So I, I am curious then, Jeff, how, how do you determine the states? Not you, but I mean, how does the USDA determine which states they're going to be looking at? Yeah, and I think what they've done is over time, it, granted, they, they always can make some adjustments. But as we dig in and look at that objective yield data, and that's where they're physically setting up plots. You know, they set those plots up and they get approval ahead of time with the farmers, but they set those plots out. And, and they would have probably about, between corn and beans, about 3,000 different plots. And on those 10 states that are, that are used on the corn side, that'd be Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Minnesota, Missouri, Nebraska, Ohio, Wisconsin. How they do is they move over to the soybean side. They use a little bit different mix. There's 11 states there versus the 10 on the corn side, but they're also going a little further south. They pick up Arkansas, but you still get Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Minnesota, Missouri, Nebraska, North Dakota, Ohio, and South Dakota. And so they could, as we go down the road, if they think they need to include additional states, they always can make some adjustments there. But that's the states that they're actually surveying um, and doing those plots in, Susan. So did anything stick out for you when you look, let's start out with corn that caught your attention? Yeah, there was a few things actually. And, and then this is what's really interesting is that this would have been the, the fourth higher. And, and a few individual states, as we dig in and look at it, I'm just going to go down through them here. For instance, Illinois, if you look at compared to last year, um, Indiana was up about 10 bushels compared to last year. Um, Kansas up about six bushels. Minnesota, though, because of the weather that they had, they were down about 14 bushels. And the one that really does surprise me a lot is Nebraska. They ended up having Nebraska's yield up eight bushels compared to last year. And, and I really kind of disagree with that one, Susan, because, well, the mix of customers we have, it, it's mostly, you know, basically eastern Nebraska with some scattered in western Nebraska. But it's a combination of dry land and, uh, and irrigated. And, and a lot of our customers and what we were seeing from where the yields were on the irrigated side were off from where they would have been last year. And the dry land is way off in many areas, so it, it's hard to believe that that we were that much higher than we were last year. But as we dig into the objective yield data, maybe it makes a little bit more sense. And, and what we end up seeing is that the first thing we look at is that what were the amount of ears per acre? And what really surprised me is that they came in at 29,450 um, ears per acre, and that compares to 28,500. So we're up 950 ears. So you think about that. If we've got 950 more ears out there uh, than, than we did last year, well, even if the ears aren't as heavy, then that still gives us the potential to see some of those adjustments on the yield that, that we ended up seeing. And then we dig in on the soybean side. And on the soybean side, it, it would be the fifth highest yield that we've had on soybeans. And a few states that kind of stand out, uh, you know, Illinois was down a couple of bushels from last year. Now, keep in mind, we were up three tenths of a bushel overall nationally from last year. Nebraska, believe it or not, and this really one surprises me too, they show that we were up two bushels a acre compared to last year. And overall, most of our customers, just like what I talked about in the corn side, would say their beans were even off more so than what we ended up seeing on the corn side. And then as we dig in, and look at, okay, but what are some of the numbers behind basically the yield? Well, what we when we look at the executive summary data and look at particularly the objective yield information that NAS puts out, what's interesting is the amount of pods that they were out there and what they found. How they report that is they report that in an 18 square foot area. So they'll look at and say, how many pods were there in 18 square feet? They found 1,800 and 75 pods this year, and that compared to 1,700 pods last year. And so we were actually up 175 pods per um, per that 18 foot square area. Now, when I think back on that, part of me, if I think back to there were some rains that we did have that for a while I was going, you know, maybe we will have a really good bean yield. And what it kind of feels like happened is that we had the rains the soybeans put on the pods, but then the soybeans just weren't able to fill those pods. So we had a lot of potential 
up there because as we dig a little bit deeper, Susan, what it's telling us is that the individual pod weight, when we'd weigh the soybeans that were in those pods, that was down about 10.2%. So I think what we can remember going forward into next year, if we happen to snag some rains, boy, we could end up raising a big bean yield in the future year, Susan. Well, speaking of weather, do you have any concerns what's happening in South America? Because I've heard that it could have some potential impact on our export abilities coming up. Yeah, there definitely is some big concerns. And as we dig in and take a look at South America, in particular, hone into Brazil and then within Brazil, get into Mato Grosso. You know, that area in through there, which is a major producer of soybeans and also the Safrina corn crop, you know, it's it's honestly probably experiencing one of the uh, driest starts to the season that we've probably had in about 40 years. And, and a couple problems that that's causing is it's definitely causing a problem with these, these planting paces, soybeans. It's behind both what we're, where we were last year and also our five-year average. And where that causes some real issues is not only on the fact that we may have to have some replant, but where that also causes a problem, Susan, is as we come back around and harvest those soybeans, they're going to get harvested later. Then that safrina crop has to follow up right after that, you know, gets planted, the safrina corn crop. And what happens if that gets planted too late, then that pushes into a really dry time in there, and that could really hurt their corn yield. So I, I think corn could actually be one of the biggest impacted, Susan. Lots of things that we talked about today. I know that folks might want to have further conversation with you, Jeff. What's the best way for them to reach out? Yeah, give me a call at 402-366-4694. Check us out on the web at heartlandfarmpartners.com or follow me on X, which is formerly Twitter, at JeffPeterson01. All right, just a reminder, commodity futures and options do involve a substantial risk of loss not suitable to all investors. And that's this week's Nebraska Soybean Board Weekly Market Roundup.